again for another Lunch and Learn. Um, today we are hanging out in the NCO quarters, which is the non-commissioned officers quarters. It's the oldest um, building at the port right now. It was built in 1878, and uh, we're probably in the bedroom of the one of the non-commissioned officers right now, so sergeants and corporals and all those guys. Um, but today we're going to be talking about the 25th Infantry at Fort Missoula, and also what happened to them beyond Fort Missoula. So. Hopefully you've had a chance to check out the five minute intro video that uh, Emily and Matt uh, were working on and posted yesterday and also the um, online exhibit that Anne put together for us. But if not, we'll kind of fill you in a little bit and then we'll try and look for comments in case anybody has any questions. Um, and then also if you watch this later and you have questions, you can uh, put them in the comments and then we'll reach out to you and let you know. So. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Christiana, I'm the Education Director, and to my right I have Matt Holter, who's our Summer Intern, and then I have Ann Smurl, who is our Museum Assistant at the Museum, well, kind of a jack of all trades, does a little bit of everything, and then we have Emily McMath, who is our AmeriCorps Leader for um, a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, so we've all been really interested in the bike soldiers, and we've been coming at it from different angles. Um, uh, Matt's been doing a lot of research using primary sources, and I believe Anne has as well, and then Emily has found a really cool blog that has all of the original newspaper articles, but then with some commentary on it, and so we were just going to have a little chat about what we thought was the most interesting about the bike soldiers, and, um, and then answer questions. So for me personally, just a little intro here, um, I've been here for about seven years, and it was one of the things that I thought was one of the more unique stories at Fort Missoula when I got here. Basically, we have late 1890s, we have uh, uh, an officer who was sent to Fort Missoula, and um, Matt, I think we'll talk a little bit more about how that happened, but he decided to do a bicycle experiment where he took his unit of soldiers um, to ride bikes all over everywhere, basically, in the, in the West to see if it was a good fit for um, military transportation. And I apologize because we've got mosquitoes in here, so we're all going to be like <laughs> smacking things. Um, I'm not beating my interns, I promise. Um, but not on camera, at least. Not on camera. <laughs> anyway, so um, and another interesting factor about this is that they were African American soldiers. So back in the 1890s, actually uh, immediately post um, Civil War, they uh, established two units of infantrymen and two of cavalry that were um, just African American. But then they did have white officers. That was the level of segregation at the time, and I believe. The army was segregated until the 1950s. It's pretty late. Yeah, during Korean War. Yeah, there's some really interesting intricacies about what African Americans were allowed to do in the army until a certain point, like after World War One, they weren't allowed to, to be part of combat. I think so, but we won't even get into that today because that's <coughs> a bridge too far. But um, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about what you thought was most interesting when you were doing your research? Sure. So before Moss's bicycle expeditions in 1896 and 1897. General Nelson Appleton Miles, the commanding general of the U.S. Army, spearheaded the nascent bicycle movement. So in the 1890s, many European armies began investigating the bicycle to see if it could replace horses as the central means of transportation for armies. And in the 1890s, General Miles actually visited Europe, and he wrote a report, which is actually in the public domain, and in his report he lauded for French, the Fran French army for how it could traverse through difficult terrain with large numbers of men, and that is something I found intriguing, that it wasn't just a local story. Right. Actually, the bicycle, investigation into the bicycle is actually a national movement. Yeah, and, and if you think about the time period then, like, uh, bicycles were an affordable means of transportation and they were becoming more common, you know, even women could ride bikes by that point. Uh, one of the first businesses in Missoula was actually a bike shop, so that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so that is interesting that it was more of a national experiment. So, yeah. um, as we know on the, um, the ride, well actually we'll get to that later, but um, Emily, mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us a little bit about what you read in your research? Yeah, so the blog that I read, um, the man compiled, you know, every single news article that had ever been written about the bike soldiers during their ride from 
um, Fort Missoula to St. Louis, and he also was included all of uh, Lieutenant Moss's um, diary entries, you know, how far they had ridden that day, the temperature, how many hours they had ridden, um, stuff like that, which was really interesting. And the man who wrote the blog post then recreated his own ride, and he made sure to comment like, oh, well, Moss said that, you know, they drove, or they rode this many miles, and um, he tried to, like, stay true to the route that the infantry made and everything. He was like, I just, I can't seem to find, like, some of the trails they went on, so they definitely rode much longer that day than I did. And, yeah. Um, talked about how they had gotten lost a few times, or the uh, infantry itself had been separated from each mm -hmm. other, so they were, like, trying to find each other along the way. So it was just kind of interesting to read, you know, kind of just, like, the mishaps that uh -huh. happened along the way that maybe the news articles didn't quite get a hold of, yeah. um, which was cool. And then something else that I just really like about the bike soldiers is that while they were here at the fort, they had a baseball team. And <laughs> since there were, you know, four different regiments within the infantry itself, um, I just like thinking that, you know, the four different regiments all have kind of like yeah, that, like the that company, rivalry. Company A, mm -hmm. be company C, D, yeah, that exactly. kind of thing. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> I like it too. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I should, do should double check the statistic, but I remember reading somewhere that one-fifth of the army in the West was African-American at this mm -hmm. point. So if you think about like deployment um, post-Civil War, you know, 30 years later, um, there's a lot, the African-American soldiers are doing a lot in the West to take care of, you know, any um, clashes between Native American tribes, between Native American tribes and settlers who are taking the land, and then later um, to sort of quell labor disputes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't probably the most exciting um, yeah. time in the uh, military history, but, uh, you know, they had a career here um, as soldiers and, you um, and they were pretty well respected, I, I believe. Like what I, from what I've read, you know, even though they had uh, white officers and that was the hierarchy of the day, like their commanding officers, like Colonel Burke here at Fort Missoula, had nothing but good things say, to say about them. Yeah. And in general, I've read that Buffalo soldiers or African American soldiers at the time had much uh, lower desertion rates than um, other comparable units. So um, it's it's just a really interesting part of our history in that way. Um, uh, the other thing, it seems that in Missoula, yeah, there was definitely racism at the time, but in general, they were well liked. Mm -hmm. um, they, they had a, a really nice band. I think we've got a picture yeah. of the band there. Um, that, you know, as they weren't really in, in the midst of any military incursions, they could do performances the for um, local townspeople. And. <coughs> Um, and there's dog. And eventually, yep, they have a dog in there. Yeah. Always a good thing. Cute dog. Um, <laughs> always a win at Emily's heart. Yeah, oh, I'm as well. We're, we're easy. Um, but, uh, and then when they did eventually leave Fort Missoula to, um, as deployed to the Spanish American War in Cuba, um, people got out really early to line the streets to say goodbye to them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they were here for at least a decade. Maybe it was more than that. I know they were in Montana for a couple decades, but um, so they were sort of a fixture in Missoula. Um, do you, let's see. Does one of you, do you want to even want to talk about um, uh, the Chaplin incident in, at the Florence? Do you remember that one? Or did, yeah. I can talk about okay. it. Yeah. Okay. So that's okay. Anne can Anne can go. So um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So the only black officer in the 25th Infantry was the regiment chaplain, so you know, their, uh, their preacher, basically. And he was generally you know, an extremely respected man, very educated, very, very liked by his men, but also by, as far as I can tell, basically everyone else. Uh -huh. um, and so for the most part, he was welcome in Missoula. You know, he was part of the military society, but also you know, kind of the religious parts of civil society. Yeah, that's right. Didn't he also perform um, services in Missoula? Yeah. Yeah, he was invited to preach at the various churches in town. He says he went to Lolo a lot, huh? um, which is interesting. Hunted with the men. What? Hunted with soldiers. Yep, okay. yep. Yeah, he was not a military man before coming to Montana, so he uh, gave himself a crash course in military life when he got here. Um, but one incident that he wrote about in his autobiography, which is available for free online, actually, if anyone's interested, yeah, we can link that too. Um, one of the, so one of his colleagues, the chaplain from 
Fortio? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I'm never sure how to pronounce it. Um, but so that chaplain came to Missoula just for a couple days and invited the chaplain of the 25th Infantry, Chaplain Stewart, to come have dinner with him. And so this visiting chaplain was staying in Florence. And so Chaplain Stewart went to the Florence, went to his friend's room, you know, they talked, it was fine. And then they were going to go down to dinner in the Florence restaurant. And when his friend went to go, you know, Science. check in Chaplain Stewart, he was told that you know, people of color were not allowed in the dining room. And that, you know, if an exception was made to this, all of the white patrons would leave. So Chaplain Stewart left that day because he didn't want to embarrass his friend. But then he talked to his commanding officer, Colonel Burt, and the two of them went into Missoula and very prominently consulted one of the best respected lawyers in town about what they could do, you know, about this discrimination. And like two days later, the owner of the Florence came to actually apologize to him in person. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. kind of, it's kind of a cool, like, Yes, there was this incident of racism. But you actually but see almost a, a bit of a resolution yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that is interesting. And that was, the, that was news to me. I hadn't read his autobiography, but um, so I was, I was glad. There's, it's, it's really cool. It's for the 25th century, we do have so much documented. Because, 50 years in the Gospel Ministries. The yeah. yeah, so um, is it Theophilus is his name, right? Which is like the best name. Theophilus Gold Stewart. Um, <laughs> We uh, so we, his book is like Anne said available online and we can share that with you. So we have his story and then we have all of the the newspaper articles because when the 25th Infantry rode from Fort Missoula to St. Louis, it was like national news. You know they covered it and people came out to see them and stuff. So there's a lot of record of you know from the newspaper's perspective. They had a newspaper reporter, uh, Mr. Booz, out with them, and uh, so we're lucky that we have that as well. And then, um, so they did all their rides here, and then they went to, this, uh, to Cuba, and that's when they ran into Teddy Roosevelt. Do you want to tell a Teddy Roosevelt thing? I can go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there's a famous battle, this is the Battle of San Juan Hill. San Juan Hill, yeah. yeah. And so, and, it, Kettle Hill. and so, Teddy Roosevelt, he was with the Rough Riders, right? Um, and so they, it was a big battle, and, it, and it's very much glorified Teddy Roosevelt's military career. But it turns out that you know they were very much aided by the 25th Infantry and the other um, African American soldiers that were there. And basically, the they ended up um, Mingo Sanders, who was one of the sergeants that we know here, ended up sharing ordering. Um, his troops to share their rations with uh, Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders because they were pretty much out of food. Um, so that wouldn't have happened without the 26th Infantry. And there is, a, I believe, the paintings by Remington. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, but there and there is, you know, there's a couple um, African American soldiers in there, some Buffalo soldiers in there, but they definitely didn't get their due for the impact that they had on the battle. And then that becomes even worse later when you find out about the Brownsville affair. So they were in Cuba, then they were in the Philippines, um, and then they came back and they were in Nebraska for like four years, and it was very boring. <laughs> and then they got sent to uh, Brownsville, Texas. And I was just reading that, the Red Book, the Brownsville Affair, I forget who wrote it. Weaver, Weaver. John Weaver. Um, and that, you know, I, is, is an amazing account because it goes through all of the congressional records and stuff that happened later. Um, but. So we have a lot of like word for word what happened and, and what that was like. But anyway, they got sent to Texas and already our friend Chaplain Stewart like was immediately worried because there was so much uh, bad feeling between um, black people or between the white people that were there as far as how they felt about the black troops coming down there. Um, so Anne, do you want to take over and just kind of let us know what happened? Yeah. So. Like Christiana was saying, there were three companies of the 25th Infantry who were sent to Fort Brown, which is right next to Brownsville. Um, and like even before they got there, the townspeople were very clear that they didn't want them there. The regiment's officers were pretty clear that they thought this was a terrible idea. There was actually, they were supposed to, on their way to the fort, stop and do like a mock battle with one of the local white regiments, 
And the officers were like, no, this is the <laughs> worst idea we've ever heard. So that was canceled. Um, but the soldiers still ended up going to Fort Brown. And they were there for less than a month um, when one of the women in town reported that she had been assaulted by someone that she described as a black soldier. It transcribed later that it was late at night and she didn't really get a, you know, she didn't get a good look at the person who assaulted her. So all she could see was that was, you know, a kind of darker complexioned person. And Brownsville is right on the Texas-Mexico border. So the town population was very mixed, white and Mexican. Yeah, wasn't that something like three quarters of the uh, town was uh, Hispanic? Something like yeah. that, yeah. Um, but she said it was one of the soldiers. And as far as I know, that was pretty much never questioned by anyone. Um, Weaver gets into it a bit, but in town, that was just immediately was accepted. accepted. Yeah. So the next day, her husband and the town mayor went to Fort Brown to confront the officers about it. And the officers were basically like, we really don't think that it was our men, but we'll do everything we can. You know, We'll investigate, we'll figure it out. And they also, brought all of the soldiers back to the fort for the night because feelings in town were very inflammatory and both the town mayor and the regimental officers felt it very unwise for there to be black soldiers in town that night. Yeah. Um, so everyone came back to the fort, they were all accounted for, and I think it was an 8 p.m. for a few, so everyone went back at the fort by 8 p.m. About midnight that night, gunshots are heard in town. And there's kind of debate about where the shooting started, but it was in the part of town closest to the fort, um, mostly into residential homes, actually. Hmm. And it lasted eight, 10 minutes, something like that. So at the fort, obviously, trained military, you know, immediately jumped into action, grabbed their rifles, formed their lines, did their roll call. Everyone was accounted for. Um, in town, there was a lot more panic. And in the aftermath, it was found that one townsperson had died and one had been injured. And every single townsperson was convinced that it had been the black soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, so in the aftermath of this, obviously there were investigations. Uh -huh. um, all of the soldiers said that they had no idea. They didn't do it, they knew nothing about it, and they were not involved. And all of the evidence seemed to agree with that. Mm -hmm. You know, they were all accounted for. None of the rifles had been fired. You know, there was no, there's no logical way really that it could have been any of the soldiers, mm -hmm. but that didn't really matter. Right. Um, because all of the eyewitness testimony from the townspeople swore up and down under oath that they knew it had been the black soldiers. Uh -huh. So the soldiers obviously were transferred away from Fort Brown, uh, brought back to Nebraska, and there was, you know, continued investigation. And eventually, when none of the soldiers were able to, you know, give any information about this, President Roosevelt gave them an ultimatum. And basically he said, if none of you come forward to tell us who did this, all of you are gonna be discharged. Um, it's, I think, the only incident of mass punishment huh. in U.S. Army history. Huh. Hmm. Um, did anybody um, stand up for them? Or was there anyone in government who, like, actually was looking at the evidence and said this is crap? Not quite initially. All of their officers uh -huh. were pretty much on their side. Um, Chaplain Stewart was definitely on their side, uh -huh. but they couldn't convince, like, the officers of the 25th Infantry couldn't convince their superiors. Because sure. this is actually an interesting trend you get with a lot of the black units, is that their commanding officers have huge amounts of respect for them, but none of the other levels of command have the same. Yeah. But then, as it kind of became more and more of a national story, there was a senator from Ohio, Senator Foraker, who was, was a political opponent of Roosevelt's. Uh -huh. um, he was looking for something he could use against the president, yeah. and so took up the cause of the 25th Infantry, read through all of the documents that had been produced thus far, realized that nothing added up, mm -hmm. and so convinced the Senate to open an official investigation. Uh -huh. And so in March of the next year, so we're 1907 now, the citizens of Brownsville were called to Washington, D.C. They testified in front of the Senate. Um, some of the soldiers also testified in front of the Senate. 
and two of the commanding officers were officially court-martialed. Uh -huh. uh, they were both found innocent, um, which is interesting because the thing they were being court-martialed for was not controlling their officers. Huh. And so they were found innocent, but their men were found guilty. Uh -huh. So that's, no one really ever explained that. It doesn't that. really make sense. It's yeah. just like they, they felt okay with doing this to them, but yep. not okay with doing yep. this to them. And so kind of the same pattern from the initial investigation keeps happening over and over, where all of the evidence was in favor of the soldier's innocence, but all of the sentiment was against them. Right. Yeah. And so at the end of the investigation, 14 of the men were found, you know, were, I guess, found innocent uh -huh. um, and reinstated for... No one knows why those 14, huh, that's it's just, they seem to have been just kind of random. Huh. Um, but all of the others, the discharge was upheld. Um, so, do you know about how many people that would have been? 167. 167 people. And yep. they were discharged without honor, discharged which is without slightly honor. different than a dishonorable discharge. Yep. But, so what does that mean if you are a career soldier? Say you're Mingo Sanders and you're about to retire. Like, what yep. happened so to him? The main thing that that means is that you can't get another government job, and that you don't get your pension. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, Mingo Sanders, who was a career soldier, he had been part of the Bicycle Corps, he had served in Cuba, he had served in the Philippines, he was two years away from full retirement, and just gone. Mm -hmm. um, he pretty much lost everything. And it kind of broke him. Yeah. Um, he was completely devastated by it. I'm sure. And he actually was one of the soldiers who traveled to Washington yeah to try and appeal this, um, he sent a telegram to President Roosevelt directly, reminding him of the incident in Cuba, trying to get anything. Yeah. He got nothing. Yeah, it's, wow. that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so, do any of you guys know, or maybe Anne can speak to this, like, so eventually, there was another investigation, right, mm -hmm. and that, that showed that they were not guilty. Yes. When did that happen? That was prompted by the Weaver book. Okay. Uh, so that book came out in 1970. And I'm not actually sure why Weaver chose to do this project. Um, I haven't found kind of what prompted it. But like you said, you know, he went back, he found all the primary documents, he laid it out really well. And President Nixon actually read the book, got interested. There was another investigation uh -huh. um, by the Senate, and all the soldiers were officially pardoned at that point because the political climate was different enough that evidence actually mattered. Uh -huh. um, For that case. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's some evidence. So. Yeah. Right. Um, and so at that point, only one of the soldiers was still living. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was officially pardoned. He was given a pension of $25,000. Um, no back pay, <laughs> but $25,000. And then he passed away a few years later. And was that Dorsey? Dorsey Willis. Dorsey Willis, okay. It's just, I mean, so hopefully those of you who are watching like agree that this is a super fascinating story. Um, and then that's, you know, we have the connection to it because they were here at Fort Missoula. Um, at least we weren't the fort that ended it all, but, um, you know, it's important to remember, you know, around the, uh, that period of time, it was really difficult to be an African American soldier, and then you have politics on top of that, and people's careers, and mm -hmm. it just totally ruined those folks. So, um, I don't know if there's some wisdom to learn by there, <laughs> other than that there are lots of. I guess one thing would be, you know, we have this uh, event that happened in what was it, 1906? 1906. 1906, and it seemed like a sham at the time, but it was pushed through, and then you know, 60-something uh, years later, someone is able to go back and look at the evidence and look at the primary sources and find a way to bring this to the attention of the people and, like, actually right or wrong. So I think that's maybe a, a bright note to note in this. Mm -hmm. um, so we have lots of plans to do more bike soldier projects and more offer more field trip options for that. Um, we are definitely not the be all end all experts on this, but it's just something that we've been researching and wanting to let you know about. So what I'll do is I'm gonna share some more links um, after we finish the video so that if you do wanna do some of your own research and learn more about this. Um, they also, we also have a friend, Farron Doss, who used to be at University of Montana, and he did a recreation of the ride with the um, Black Student Union at UM back in the 70s, I believe. 
And he wrote a really cool book, a historical fiction book called, what was she, Old Glory? Old, I will link it in the bottom so you can buy it and support Farron because he's a super awesome guy. And he's been out to do some talks here at the fort too. But it's a, you know, if you have younger, like maybe early teens or even as an adult, it's a nice way to get into this period of history by reading historical fiction. So um, we haven't been able to see any comments. And if people have commented, it's just Facebook Live is weird like that. So if you guys are asking questions, we'll go back through and answer them. But um, in the meantime, anything else? Everybody good? Two years marks the 125th anniversary. Oh, that's a good point. So that just reminded me we've got two years till the 125th anniversary of the ride to St. Louis. And we are in the process of planning um, a, a new, hopefully a new exhibit in here that features that and then working with the Buffalo Soldiers reenactors to see if they'll come out too. So, you know, we'll see what life is like with the, uh, maybe we won't be wearing masks by then, who knows? <laughs> uh, maybe we'll have to get some cool like uh, 25th Infantry masks. <laughs> yeah. um, but in the meantime, you know, uh, you find us on Facebook and our website and YouTube page and um, we'll be back for another Facebook Live sometime soon. Thanks guys.